You know, if you've been with us, you know that on Sunday morning we began a new series of messages entitled The Power of Giving. And I want to follow that series tonight, talk to you on the subject of money talks, money talks. Have you ever heard the expression money talks? And you know, you know, when someone says money talks, they mean, you know, we can say a lot, but it's our actions, it's our money, it's when we put it out there that really matters. I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> What if we decided, you know, we pick up an offering every, uh, every Sunday, every Wednesday, and one of the things that we tell you to do is we don't pass it around the plate right now because of COVID. What we do is we have boxes at the exit, and we say on your way out, you can deposit your tithe, your offering, your giving there. But what, but what, what, if, uh, what if I changed that? What if one day you came in and I said to you, I want you to come down to the altar, and I want you to place your tithe and your offerings here? And uh, as you did that, I would be there looking at you and seeing what you put in and evaluating your giving. And I'd be looking and checking it out and seeing who gives and who doesn't give. And, and I point out, why didn't you not come up? You know, imagine if I were to do that. Some of you would probably be offended. Some of you would say, Pastor Vic, that's an invasion of privacy. Why wouldn't the world would you even think about doing that? Well, I, I, I'm not thinking of doing it, but the scripture that I have for you tonight, Jesus did that. Over there in the Gospel of Mark, we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 12, in verse 41 and 40 through 44, and that's exactly what Jesus did. Notice what it says in verse 41. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple, and he watched as the crowd dropped in their money. And many rich people put in large amounts. And then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. So notice what the scripture says. The scripture says Jesus is in Jerusalem. He goes to the temple and he finds a seat right by the temple treasury. In other words, where people would come and give their, their, their taxes and their tithe and their offerings. And what Jesus is doing is that he's observing. It's very clear. He's watching, which means he's intently watching what they're doing. And he not only saw who was doing the giving, but he saw what they were giving. He noticed the amounts. And the Bible tells us that he makes an evaluation of their giving. And notice, he evaluates it. Now, some of you, when you read that, you ask yourself, why in the world would Jesus do that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because Jesus was interested in what people were given. And by the way, he is still interested in what we give because money talks. Amen. Money communicates a lot. Do you realize that what we do with our money speaks a lot about us, our relationship to God, and what we value, what's important to us? What does how you spend or give your money say about you? Well, Jesus said it says a lot. If Jesus watched what they were giving and he still watches it, what would be his opinion about your handling of your money and what you give? What will he think about that? Now, I, I don't know what any of you give to the Lord through living word. One of the things that I've told people often is, honestly, I don't know what anybody gives to this church. And really, I'm not interested. And the reason why I'm not interested in knowing what anybody gives is because I believe your giving is between you and God. It's a personal matter. But the other reason is I don't want to be biased by knowing what you give or don't give. I don't want to ever be put in a situation, well, i got to pay attention to these couple because they give a lot of money, and I'm going to ignore this person because they give no money. I don't want to ever be put in that situation. So if you ever call and you want to meet with me that day and they say, Pastor's busy, it's not because I know you give and don't give and say, hey, I don't want to talk to that person. They don't give. That's not at all. If they tell you I'm busy, it's because I'm busy. But in our text today, you know, uh, the Bible, Jesus is there watching the giving of the people. Now, there's a couple of important principles that I want us to learn about giving and what God's word says on the subject of giving and of money and of possessions and about managing it. There's three things I want to point out to you from this story. Number one, and real quick, God cares about our giving. Number two, God cares about how much we give, and God cares about how we give. Our giving, how much, and how we give. You see, what we see Jesus doing in there in this passage in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus does it all the time, and he does it in all things. You know what? He sees and he knows our giving. I don't, but he does. He sees all our giving. 
As a matter of fact, not only does he see all our giving, he sees all our living. He sees what we do every single day of our lives. Now, if you were here on Sunday, one of the things that I told you when we started our series is that the subject of money is a very touchy subject for a lot of people. And a lot of people don't want to hear about it. Now, I would think, honestly, I would think that a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ would be eager to know what does God think about and what does God have to say about money, about possessions, about the management of it, about how we should give it. And not only do I think we should be eager to know, because the Bible is the most important book in all of the world, but also we would be interested in obeying what God has to say about this subject. I believe with all my heart that anyone who is serious about following the Lord Jesus Christ has to take his giving seriously, because God does. So so I guess I want to ask you tonight, how do you give? And if Jesus were to observe your giving today, and he does, What would be his opinion? Because by the way, this day in this scripture that I'm reading to you, Jesus definitely has some opinions about the giving of the people that he observed. Now, let me give you a couple of reasons why I have come to understand why some Christians don't like to give to God. Not only are some Christians bothered by the subject, some Christians have sort of made up their mind, you know what, I'm not going to give, and I'm not going to tithe, and I'm not going to give offerings, and and I'm not going to do any of that. And I'll tell you why I think that happens. Let me give you reason number one. I believe the reason why some believers don't give to God is because they've never been taught about what the Bible says about giving. They really don't know because I believe if you knew what God says in his word about giving, it would change your mind. Because of the way some people react to this mention of money, some, some preachers never approach the subject. There's a lot of pastors that will never talk about what the Bible says about this subject. And then when you consider all the scandals in the church, you know what, in the religious world about money and how it's misused and how, you know what, preachers do this and and all of that, there's a lot of pastors that won't, they're hesitant, they're they're leery, they're afraid to bring up the subject because I'll tell you what, we know people don't want to hear about it. They do surveys every year and they'll ask people, what is the number one thing that bothers you about church? And they say, it's the money subject. They're always talking about money. That's the number one thing when people are are surveyed that they don't like about the church. So what happens is there's a lot of believers that never get taught about what God's word says on the subject of giving, of money, and all of that. And yet I want you to know the Bible has a lot to say about it. The Bible says, goes as far as saying God's interested in your money. And the reason why is because he's interested in you. He's interested in your welfare. He doesn't want your money. He's interested because he wants your heart, and he knows that our heart gravitates toward money. There's nothing more important for people today than their money, and God knows that. And that's the number one, I told you on Sunday, the number one competition to God. It's not the devil. It's our money. It's our possession. You know, as your pastor, I want you to know that I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm responsible before God, and one day I'm going to give an account to God with, that I shared the word of God. I, I feel bad for those pastors that one day are going to stand before God and say, did you teach my people my word? And they're going to say, no, I told a lot of great stories. I was very inspirational. I was very motivational, but never did I open your word. Never did I talk to them about your word. Because I'm of the opinion, that's the number one responsibility that I have to share all of God's word. Not just the parts that I like or that I know you like and avoid the parts you don't want to hear about, but every single, the Bible says the whole counsel of God, his word. And it has a lot to say about money, about finances, about managing. And I'll tell you what, when you understand what God's word says about it, it's very liberating. You know, one of the big problems today with people is that they're in bondage to materialism. There's a lot of people that love money. Money's not the problem. You know what? The love of money is the root of all evil. And there are a lot of people that are very evil and materialistic, and they'll have no problem backstabbing you, jumping over you, mistreating you, taking advantage of you. You know why? Because they want more money. And because God knows that, God has a lot to say on this subject. The second reason I believe people don't give is not only do they, are they not taught from, well, about what the Bible says about giving, but a lot of Christians have a misunderstanding about what the Bible says about giving, especially tithing. They know, but they, they misunderstand what the Bible says. There's a lot of Christians today, you say, well, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, there's a lot of Christians today that, that, that say, you know what, giving and tithing is an Old Testament idea. It's not something for today. 
It's not commanded in the New Testament, and nowhere in the Bible are New Testament believers told to tithe or to give. And, uh, of course, my response to that is, I don't know what Bible you're reading, but my Bible, there's a, a lot of occasions. So what I want to try to do is I want to try to explain to you what the Bible says about tithing, because that seems to be very controversial today. What does the Bible say about tithing, especially for New Testament believers, for us, for our generation, for our life? But let me start off by saying to you this. Let me just tell you a couple of things off the top. Your giving is between you and God. It's nobody's business. You know, if you ask yourself, Pastor, does God love me still? If I don't give anything, absolutely he loves you. Is God against me if I don't tithe or I don't give? No, he's not against you. God will love you. God doesn't love you because of what you give or how good you are. So let's get that clear. You know, I, I have pastor friends that believe that if you don't tithe, you're, you're sinning. You are, you are a thief, and thieves don't go to heaven. I don't agree with that. I don't believe that. I, I, I want you to know that it's between you and God, and God doesn't love you more because you give, and he doesn't love you less because you don't give. All right? So that, let's get that very clear. But there's a lot of Christians that struggle with this issue and this idea of tithing. And, and rightly so. You know, sometimes in some churches it's overemphasized and, and, you know, it's talked a lot about. And then sometimes many Christians just don't want to submit to what the Bible says if they do know what the Bible says. They're just, you know, it's funny how we pick and choose what we like. You know, if I like this, I say amen. If I don't like that, I just, you know, just go like that because uh, I don't want to hear that. But that subject of tithing and giving is not intended to do anything else. It's intended to be joyful and a blessing. And yet, in the case of the church today, that is not the case. It is very divisive. Uh, it is very controversial. So I want to try to explain to you what my understanding is. And I already told you, God loves you absolutely. By the way, if you gave no money to Living Word, are you still welcome to Living Word? Absolutely. Will anyone ever call you on the phone and say, listen, you're not welcome here because I noticed you didn't give anything last year? Never will that happen. Never, never, ever will that happen. Because of what we believe. God loves you. God doesn't change his mind because of your giving. But let me talk to you about tithing. Tithing is an Old Testament concept. By the way, in the Old Testament, a tithe was a requirement of the law. The Israelis in the Old Testament were required to give 10% of everything. You know, of course, they didn't, you know, their, their economy wasn't cash. It was, it was their crops. It was their livestock. And 10% of everything that they had, which was the, the first fruit, they were to bring it to God. They were to bring it to the temple. They were to bring it to the priest. And uh, in, my, in your notes there, I put all the scriptures in the Old Testament about that because I don't have time to go one by one. But all those scriptures, you can look it up when you get home. In fact, let me go as far as telling you, in the Old Testament law, it didn't just require one tithe. There was a multitude of tithes. There was one for the Levites who served at the temple, supported. There was one for the use of the temple and the feast, and there was one for the poor, you know, like a, like a welfare system. And when you really look at the Old Testament, what it taught about giving and tithing and all of that, it wasn't 10%. When you really put it all together, it's somewhere between 23% and 30%. That's what they actually give. And the reason why that was necessary is because in the Old Testament, the tithe was a method of taxation. And that's how it provided for the nation. That's how it provided for the priests, for the, Le the, the Levites, the sacrificial system. That's how they were able to, to function and, and pay for all that they had to do. Now, a couple of general ideas about tithing, and I want you to listen carefully, and I want you to listen closely, and don't misinterpret, and don't go out and say something I did not say, but I want you to know a couple of things. It is true, tithing is never commanded in the New Testament. You're never going to read in the New Testament where it says, it is a law, I command you to tithe. Now, the reason why that was the case, because when they, by the time we get to the New Testament, you know what, they are not under the Levitical law. They are now under the Roman Empire. And uh, while they were required to bring some taxes you know what, to the temple. That's what Jesus is doing there. He's watching people bring money because they were required, but it wasn't the same that was required in the Old Testament. It was sort of like a temple tax. That's what we know from history. But one of the things that they also did was that they were, they were required to pay taxes to the Roman Empire. Now, in the Old Testament, they had what was called a theocracy. It was a government under the rule of God, but, but administered by the priest. So that's why they were required. When we get to the New Testament, there is no instruction, direct instruction about New Testament believers are to tithe. 
The third thing I want you to know is that they, they, they did pay some taxes and they did give some money to the temple, as I already mentioned. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that one of the disciples that become an apostle that Jesus chooses is a guy, a guy by the name of Matthew. And the Bible tells us that Matthew was a tax collector. And tax collectors, by the way, were, were despised. They were the scum of the earth. They were considered traitors uh, to the Jewish state because they didn't work. They didn't collect taxes for the Jewish state. They collect taxes for the Roman Empire. And because of that, they were hated. They were despised. Matthew was despised. Have you, ever, have you been watching the movie, the series, The Chosen, that makes it very clear? They didn't like Matthew, all right? But the New Testament, and this is what I want you to get, nowhere designates a percentage of income a person should set aside. But what the New Testament does say is that we should give. It talks about giving, there's no doubt. But when the Bible talks about giving, and I'm going to show you the scriptures, it does instruct us to give, but nowhere does it say 10%. So look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. Notice what it says. On the first day of each week, you should set each put aside a portion of the money that you have earned. Now notice, it doesn't say put aside 10%. And by the way, nowhere, let, let, let me tell you the, the caveat, and I want you to get this. Nowhere does the Bible teach that 10% of your income belongs to God and the 90% is yours. Nowhere does it teach that. You know what the Old Testament and New Testament teaches? It teaches 100% of what you have and what you own belongs to God. What the Bible does teach is that it all is his, and you are simply a steward. You are a, a manager. You are a trustee. You are responsible to distribute it in his name and for his glory and according to what he tells you. So the true Christian attitude should be, Lord, it's all yours. And you, whatever you want me to do with it, you tell me, and I'll do it. That's what the New Testament teaches. By the way, this is also the teaching of Jesus. You know, one day he was asked whether... You know, and I mentioned this on Sunday. He was asked by people, hey, should we pay taxes to, to Caesar or not? And one of the guys that was there, he says, does anyone have a coin? The guy gave him a coin and holding it up, he says, whose image is on this coin? And they said, well, Caesar. And Caesar, then Jesus said, well, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. In other words, Jesus acknowledges that there is God's portion. And I'll tell you what God's portion is. According to the Bible, it's all of it. You see, so the, the teaching in the New Testament is a little bit more intense than just, than just God just wants 10 and the 90% you do whatever you want. No, the New Testament says 100% is his. All right? Now, the, the story that I just read to you, I put in your notes where you can find it. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and the Gospel of Luke. But, but the Bible is very clear that we hold things in trust that God has given us. And he has a lot to say about what he's given us and how we're to use it, how we're to manage it, how we're to invest it. The overarching theme of what the Bible, the New Testament says about New Testament giving is this. You must, you know what, be a generous giver. Because God is good to you and because God owns it all and it's not all yours, proper Christian giving is generosity. So we know the Bible teaches that we're to be givers. So it's not 10%. You know what? And so you say, Pastor, well, I was always taught it, it, it's 10%. So you're telling me that nowhere does it require that? No, I'll tell you, it all belongs to God. So how much should I give? And people always ask, well, well what, what, what do we give, Pastor? Well, listen, what we tell you is, and this is what you hear from us, and this is what causes some confusion, a good place to start is 10% because that was good in the Old Testament, and it wasn't 10, it was 25 to 30%. But you know what? That's a, that's a recommended minimum for Christians, and, and they're giving, that's a good start. If it was good for the Old Testament, it's good for us. Now, it's a good place for you to begin. And people say, well, Pastor, I can't do that. You know, well, well, do what you can, but be consistent. Be generous, as generous as you can. Some of you say, well, Pastor, I can give 1%, or I, I, I can give 3 or 4 or 5 You know, there are some Christians that give more than 10%. You know, the owner of Hobby Lobby, David Green, is a Christian, and I don't, know, I don't know if you know what Hobby Lobby is, but I heard David Green once at a pastor's conference, and he was sharing us how he handles his finances. It's a billion-dollar company. And uh, he was telling us, and, and if you follow him, he's very generous. They're closed on Sundays because they're Christians. But he, he, he was telling us, you know, I, from the business that comes in, all the profits of the business that come in, 90%, he said, I give to missions. 
90% of the profits of the business go to missions. He goes, I, on my personal salary, I, 90%, I give to my church and to the activities of my church and the kingdom of God and the outreaches, and I live with 10%. In other words, he gives 90% to God. Now, David Green didn't get up there and say, no, because I do it, you have to do it. He doesn't say that, but he says, you know, people always ask, you know, what, what's the amount I should give? Well, God has spoken to me, God has blessed me, and you know what? My 10% is even more that's left over, it's even more than I can spend or I would ever need. But the idea that David Green shared is that money talks. Money talks about what's important to you. It says a lot about your attitudes, about your attitude toward God and what do you think about God, about whether you're glorifying God or not. Because the Bible says in all things that we do, we are to glorify the Lord. Nothing that should be done, you know what, without bringing glory to Him. So when you and I give, the New Testament says we are acknowledging that Everything we have belongs to God. And I wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for the Lord. That's, that's what the New Testament teaches. Now, I, I understand that. I've told you many times. I was 16 years old. I had nothing to my name. I told the Lord, Lord, my life is yours. And whatever my life produces, it's yours. And Lord, whatever you give me is yours. And, and you know, I, and, and I realized that God has blessed me personally more than I ever deserved or ever thought possible. But I'll tell you why. Because I acknowledge that it all belongs to God. It's not mine. The third reason, so, so people are, have a misunderstanding about tithing and giving in the New Testament. And to the best of my ability, I just try to explain to you what it is. We're to be generous. It's all God's. We acknowledge that. And according to as the Lord has blessed us, we are to give to the Lord. But here's the third reason why some people don't give to the Lord. It's because they just refuse to do so. They're not interested. There are some people that don't tithe because they just say, you know what, I'm not going to do it. It's my money, and uh, you're not going to talk me into it, no matter what you say, Pastor Victor, no matter what God says, no matter what the Bible says. And uh, I, I know and I trust that none of you are in that category. And I, I believe that a lot of our church people are not in that category. But a lot of people are. But I want to go back to the story, and I want you to notice that Jesus is at the treasury of the temple, and, and he's there watching those that are giving, and I'll tell you why. Because God has always been interested about our giving. He cares about our giving. He cares about our giving because he cares about our spiritual welfare. He cares about our relationship with him. And God knows, and Jesus knew, that giving is obedience to God. And giving displays our love for the Lord. And if we're faithful in our giving, God has promised that he'll open the windows of heaven and he'll bless us with a blessing until there's no more room to receive it. By the way, that's what God told the people in the Old Testament. Over there in the book of Malachi, in chapter 3, in verse 10 through 13, notice what it says. And, and, and by the way, I believe that that promise that he gave back then still stands true for today. What he told the people of Israel, I believe still applies to us today when it comes to our giving to the Lord. Notice what he writes, in, starting in verse 8. Should people cheat God? You have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? This is God speaking. You have cheated me of the tithe and the offering due to me. Back then, it was a requirement. It wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't a good idea. You, they had to do it. Verse 9, you are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. In other words, it was, it was, they were all doing it. It wasn't one or two. There was a spirit of, of unfaithfulness and disobedience to God. Look at verse 10. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. And if you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of the heaven's armies. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Now, notice that. And what I'm telling you is God, number one, God cares about our giving. It's important. It should be important to us. God doesn't take it as something minor or something unimportant or insignificant. It's very important to God, and he cares. And I'll tell you why. God knows if he has your checkbook, he knows he has your heart. If he doesn't have your checkbook, he knows that your heart's following your checkbook and not following him, and there's this competition. And God says, I, that's not going to work. He has your heart. So the other thing, the second thing I want you to know that we learn from this story, not only that God cares, here's number two, he cares about how much we give. He really does. Notice, you know, from our text that, that Jesus is there and he's observing their giving. And notice he observes what they gave. 
You know, there's a picture of the temple. By the way, he's at the temple, and uh, that's what the temple looked like. When we go to Israel, we get to go to the, to the mount of the temple mount, which is up there. That temple's not there anymore. As a matter of fact, what's close to there that was there is, is what we call the Dome of the Rock. It is a Muslim shrine, that gold cupola, you know, and then there's a Alaska mosque. There's another mosque, a, a, a Muslim mosque. But, but there at the temple, when Jesus goes, what Mark tells us, he goes to the temple and he goes to the treasury. There was a, a part of the temple was where the people came and gave their money. And we know historically that people would come in and there were these brass treasure chests where people would put in their contributions. As a matter of fact, history tells us that they call them trumpets. And if you look closely there, they look like little containers and they have the form of a, of a, of a trumpet because you put it in and then it would go into a, it would go into a case, it would go into a, a basket. And, uh, but they were tra- uh, shaped like trumpets. The Talmud, which is a Jewish commentary of the Old Testament, it tells us that next to each trumpet was an inscription indicating what the offering was for. So they picked up several different offerings. There was a, a lot of reasons and, that people gave. But because of this method of giving, some people that wanted to show off, you know what, they could show off. The rich people would go and, and they would show off because these, these little trumpets, these little containers were made out of brass. And like I said, they funneled into this chest. And when they would put their coins, because they didn't have any currency, they didn't have any bills, it was all coins. So imagine you want to give $100 and you go get all pennies and you're going to put them through there and because it's brass, it's going to make a lot of noise. And uh, you're going to be there for a while. And it would catch the attention of the people. And that's what Jesus is observing. And the Bible tells us, one of the scriptures says that he saw many rich people come along and they put in very large sums of money. And as they did, the Bible says Jesus didn't say a word. He's just observing. But uh, there are people that are watching and they're in line and, and, you know, they're probably going, ooh and ah and wow, that's amazing, you know. And look at how much that guy came and sort of took his time, pulled out his money back, poured it in, all, all, this, all this kind of money. And then all of a sudden, there comes this widow. Our text says she was a, a poor widow. And the Bible says she had two coins. And you're going to see what those coins are. You know what? Depending on the version of the scripture you're reading, she had, it's called mites. Or two copper coins, and actually the word is, the, the Greek word is lepta, and it means thin ones because they were very small and they were very thin. And they were probably worth, according to scholars of the time, historical scholars, they tell us that the worth of one of those was about a quarter of a penny. Or a, a quarter to half of what we call today a penny. It was the smallest coin that they had. All right? And... and And Jesus reveals that she had two of them. Notice, he notices how much he's giving. Two mites. Okay, she didn't bring ten. She she brought two. And she came, and the Bible says she dropped them both into the temple treasury. And Jesus makes a comment about what she did. Jesus said she gave all that she had. That was all she had. Now, if she would have given one, she would have given 50%. She didn't give 10%. She didn't even give 50%. The Bible says, Jesus said she give it all. And when she did, Jesus couldn't keep quiet. Jesus got excited. He said nothing uh, about when the rich guys came and gave their large amount of monies. He's just observing. But when the widow came and she gives all that she had, Jesus jumps up. He's animated. He turns to his disciples and says, guys, come over here. Let me show you something. I want you to notice something. And let me read it to you again from verse 43. Truly I say to you. This is what he's telling the disciples. This poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. In other words, what impressed Jesus, because he's observing what they're giving, you know what? It impressed Jesus. She gave everything. And because God cares and God notices what we give, how much we give. Now, Jesus said, all the other guys gave out of their surplus. You know what that means? They gave from their leftovers. This is what was left over. That's what they gave. It was a lot, but they had a lot left over. But this widow was different. She gave out of her want. In other words, what she gave cost her everything. She gave sacrificially. And Jesus commends her because it cost her to give. You see, a lot of times... Why this is important? Because we want to give, but we don't want it to cost us. You know what, Pastor Vic? I'm willing to, I hear you. I understand there's light, and I understand why we do this. But you know what? It's if I have anything left over. 
if I can. And how many of you know we never have anything left over? Amen. Because a little bit we do, we spend it. You know, but she gave everything. And it caught the attention of Jesus. So much so he gets excited. That reminds me of the story. There's a, there's a story in the Old Testament about King David. You know, King David is the king of Israel and second king of Israel. God is prospering him. And, and uh, David, you know, goes and he buys what is called the threshing floor of Arana, a Jebusite there in Jerusalem. There's this piece of land, by the way, that's high, by the way, where later on the temple will be built, the Temple Mount. And uh, it will be the site where they will build the temple. He won't be able to build it, but King Solomon will build it. And when David went to purchase it from, from Arana, this Hebusite, by the way, Je Jebel was the name of, of, of the city of Jerusalem uh, before they changed the name. You know, uh, the, the Arana, he didn't want to sell it because he was afraid. You know, hey, this guy's king. He's powerful. I mean, so he says, I'll give it to you. It's yours for the taking. As a matter of fact, I know you want to build uh, altars there and you want to, you know, well, I'll give you the oxen. I, I have some oxen. I'll give you the wood that you need. And, you know, take it, take whatever you need. I'm not going to charge you a penny. And it's amazing what David says to him. First of Chronicles 21, 24 tells us what David responded to him. Notice what David says. No, no, I don't, that's not going to happen. But I will surely buy it for you, from you for a price. For I will not offer burnt offering to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. In other words, David says, I'm not going to give God something that didn't cost me. I'm not going to give him something that I got for free. You know, but this is what these rich guys were doing. They're at the treasure. They, they, were, they, were, they were bringing their surplus. Large amounts, but it didn't cost them anything. You know what? They had it, and they had more than enough. They could have done more. But this widow gave to God what cost her all that she had. I want to ask you, have you ever looked at your income? Have you ever seriously looked at your income and your tithing to see what percentage do you really give to God? Now, I told you, God doesn't. Some of you say, well, I give 10%. God bless you. Some give more than that. But, you know, have you ever stopped to look at what really, if you look, if you made $1,000 a year, how much of that really went to the Lord? You know, $1, that's 1%. You know, 50 cents, that's half of a percent. You know, or, or $10 or $5, I should say. Have you ever really paid attention? I, I want to recommend that you do because God matters to God. God sees it. And you know what's interesting about what God sees? He blesses us according to our giving. I'm going to show you that. So God cares not only about our giving, God cares not only about how much we give, but God cares about how we give, how we do it, the attitude. In other words, he cares about, you know what, what's behind it. Now, this is apparent to the response that Jesus gives, you know, of the widow's gift. It's very clear. You know, the crowd probably was oohing and aahing when the rich guys came, and you know what, this woman comes, and probably very meek, very humble, probably a little embarrassed, compared to everybody else, wasn't giving that much, probably goes unnoticed, her head down, giving this, you know what, half a penny in the offering receptacle, gave it all. And, and I don't imagine anyone was ooing and awing when she made her contribution. But Jesus does. Jesus looks at that, and he's excited. I mean, he gets... Hey, listen, this is how I told you. You got to say, guys, come here. I don't know what the other guys were doing. They're probably out, you know, whatever they were doing. He says, come, I want you to notice. He got very excited. And I'll tell you why. Because of her motivation. You see, you can give out of many different types of motivations. You know, there are some people that give to be seen of men. Jesus talked about the people. There's some that they want to be seen. They want you to notice. They, they want, and they'll tell you, I give this much to the church. And, and Jesus said, don't do that because that's your reward. You know, if you're a bragging and you want people to know, you know what, that's your reward. You know, and, and there's some people that give grudgingly. You know what grudgingly means? Is out of, they give out of necessity. Oh, you know what, the pastor said, thank you for giving. And I don't got to give something. But you know what, I'd rather, you'd rather not give it. You sort of murmur, I don't know. You know, it looks like they don't need any money here. I don't know why, I don't know why they're always begging for money. And I've told you, I get accused of begging for money. And I hardly ever talk about money. It's just convenient for people that don't want to give, right? So to point the finger at the pastor, he says, oh, that's all they want. And there are other people that give, their motivation is because they want to get. You know, they, they believe the message, give God $10, he'll give you $100. It's like, you know what, it's like, a, like some type of a, a lottery. You know, and, but our, our attitude matters to God. So you ask yourself, what should be our attitude when we give to the Lord? What's the right attitude? By the way, attitude is very important. The reason, the motivation. 
So let me tell you what should be our motivation. What should be our attitude when we get... If you want to be blessed by God, and I'm going to show you where God says, I'll bless you when you're generous. But the first attitude is we give because we love the Lord. And we're thankful for all that God has done for us. We give because we love Him and we're thankful. You know, I'm thankful that Jesus gave His life for me. You know what? I'm thankful that God has blessed me beyond what I deserve. I'm thankful for all that He's done for me and for my family. And when I give and I put God in my budget, I do it out of a heart that loves Him and is grateful. We give because we're thankful. Our first uh, attitude and our attitude should be thankful giving. I'm th- never should anyone give us as man. I could have. I could have. Bought ten, I could have taken my family to McDonald's this morning. You know what? Or I could have paid a car payment. Or I could have invested in this. Listen, that's not thankful. That's grudgingly giving. No, give it with a thankful heart. Can I hear a good amen to that? The other attitude, uh, the other motivation for our giving, the Bible says we should be cheerful givers. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, that God loves a cheerful giver. You know what the word cheerful is in the Greek? It's a word that means hilarious. You know what hilarious means? Someone who's happy and smiling and joyful, not does something, you know, has a good attitude. And when it comes to giving, doesn't do it because he has to, but he gets to. It's a delight. It's a blessing. You know, I, I, I know that some churches, their pastor has taught that when you guys give, you know what, raise it up in your envelope and give the Lord a big praise. And it's amazing when people begin to praise God because they're happy. Those that aren't happy aren't going to lift up their hands and they're not going to praise God. But do it joyfully. Our giving, the other thing is, the Bible says our giving is to be liberal, to be generous. Notice Jesus said these words. Notice what Jesus said. The Gospel of Luke chapter 6, verse 38. By the way, there's a lot of scriptures. I don't have time to give you all. I'm just giving you some of them. But look at what Jesus said about your generosity. He said, give and it will be given to you. In other words, you give and as you give, it will be given to you. Look at good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, they will pour into your lap, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. In other words, if you're giving God with a teaspoon, don't expect, you know what, a shovel full from God. That's what it's saying. You see, because, uh, you know, according to our giving, that's how we get back. And by the way, this, he's talking about our finances. He's talking about our money. But this is also true for everything. If you give love, you're going to get love back. And the, the, con- the amount of love you give, that's how much you're going to get back. You give words of encouragement and you're there for people. In your time of need, people are going to be there for you. You know what? You're down and out and people are, are encouraging you and, you know what, telling you they're praying for you because you tell them, you pray for them. And they're going to, they're going to, they're going to reciprocate. That's what it teaches. You see, God is not like the movie theaters. Have you ever gone to the movie theaters and bought popcorn and they charge you 30 bucks for a little bucket? And then by the time you get to the seat, because you've been bouncing up and down, it's like half full as it's compressed. Have you noticed that? As a matter of fact, when I go to the movies and I get popcorn, I don't go too much in the movies, so don't get excited. I, I, it's not a sin. I just don't. I just never have. I'm not, you know. But when I go get popcorn, I get one for my wife, and I'm there, and I, I push it down. I say, can you fill it up some more? And then she goes, yeah. And I push it down some more, and can you fill it up before I go see it? Because I don't want to have to be coming three times. Amen? But God's not like that. You know, God says when, when you give, it'll be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It's going to be so much, it's going to overflow. God is, has an overflow blessing to those that are generous. The Bible teaches that. And you say, well, Pastor, are you sure that's talking about our giving to God? Absolutely. Look at the context. In the Greek, in the Latin, in, the, in whatever language, you, in Spanish, in whatever language you want to look at it, it's ca- talking about our generosity with our giving. God will bless you. You will never outgive God. God will never keep, you know what, what you give him, he will always return it. Now look at what 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says. Paul writes, he says, now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Again, look at the context, Greek, Hebrew, whatever language you want to look at, he's talking about giving. And he uses the analogy of the farmer, a farmer that is stingy with his seed. When it comes time to reap, it's going to be very little. But a farmer, if you've ever seen a farmer, they go out, a generous farmer, he goes out and he scatters the seed. He scatters a lot. You know why he scatters a lot? Because he knows that the more seed that he scatters, the more harvest he's going to get. That's what Paul is talking about. If you're stingy stingy with your sowing, you're going to be disappointed when it comes to reaping. The measure we pour out shall be the, the same measure we get back. And if we're stingy, 
If we're tight, you know what? We're going to receive very little. But if we're bountiful, if we're generous, we're going to receive it in abundance. Because you can never outgive God. You know, the Lord, the Bible says the Lord loves a liberal, generous giver. And some people have a disease called the cirrhosis of the giver. Amen. Can I hear that? You know what the cirrhosis of the giver is? They don't want to give anything. And by the way, let me be clear. You don't have to. God loves you. You're still going to go to heaven when you die. But in this life, you're not going to experience the blessings that God has promised to the generous believer. You are also not part of what God is doing to touch our world. You're not part. You know what? The church is still the best hope for the world. Can I hear a good amen to that? By the way, if there was a better organization or a better way of touching people's lives, I would resign as a pastor and I would join that organization. But there is not. There is no organization that changes lives, makes people's lives better. You know what? It helps them live better lives than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And many of you know that. You know, my, my, my grandparents got saved when a missionary came to, to the farmers, to the farm laborers in Arizona in the 30s. In the 40s, there were a lot of farm laborers. And missionaries would come. And some of them were Anglo, and they'd bring interpreters. And the gospel got to my great-grandparents. And from my great-grandparents, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, and from there my mother and my father, and from there us, and now my children. I owe a lot to those people who supported those men. And I don't even know if they had support. I'm assuming they did. I don't know if anyone says, you know what, we're going to give you 50 bucks a, a month for your gas as you travel around, and we're going to give you some money so you can have something to... I, I don't know, because I do know they were, they were full-time. That's what they did for a living. But, but I, I, I'll tell you, I am the recipient, and so are you, of the fact that somebody gave. You come to this church, and I'll tell you what, you are benefiting from the giving and the generosity of people that help build this. And you sit and you enjoy it, like praise God. But you know what I want? I want to make sure that when I'm gone and when you're gone, there is still a place where the people, our neighborhood, our kids, our grandkids could come and hear of the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ and have their lives touched. I want that to continue. I don't want it to die when we die. You know, and some people just don't see it that way. And then the last thing I want to say, say to you is that our, our, our another motive is that our, our, our giving should be sacrificial in nature. What does that mean? It means that it has to cost us. It can't be out of a surplus. It must be out of our need. I already told you, Jesus was not impressed with those who gave what was left over, but he gave to those, you know what? He, he was blessed by that widow who gave everything. Now, God's not asking you for 100%. He might ask some of you. I mean, I'm really impressed. We got some young missionary people that have said, you know, college educated, that have said, I'm leaving everything and I'm going to Africa, I'm going to India, I'm going to the Philippines, I'm going where God has called me to. And I'm like, wow, they've given up everything. Now we support and we help, and that's why I, I feel such an urgency to help them because I'm like, wow, who in the world does that? Who in the world says no to what America offers? Because say, say, I want to respond to what God has called me to do and, and, and go to wherever, you know what, in some of the hard places. Today I posted on our Living Word Facebook, Pray for the Ukraine. You know, we have missionaries in the Ukraine that have been pulled out because it's dangerous. We have missionaries that are in Syria, you know, with all that's going on in Iraq and Baghdad. We have missionaries in Egypt. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be going to Egypt. And we have missionaries in Egypt. And we're going to go visit them and help preach with them. And we have a very strong Egyptian church in Egypt. Be speaking in some of those churches in a couple of weeks. But, you know, that work doesn't happen without people giving sacrificially. Because here's what happens. Sometimes some of you are faithful and you're giving to and tithe and that. And then we come with mission and say, Pastor, what, what are you thinking? I mean, I don't have, we only have so much. I know. But sometimes there's sacrificial giving. You know, I, I have made up my mind. I, I'm not going to take my car to be washed every two, three weeks. I'm going to wash it once and take another time, and I'm going to save 30 bucks. And maybe I can give that to missions. I've stopped drinking coffee, not because God told me. I just got sick once, and I didn't want coffee anymore. But I'll tell you what, I'm saving about $20 a week from Starbucks, 80 bucks, maybe 100 bucks a month. Maybe I can give that to missions. I do. You guys are getting too quiet on me, amen. Am I, am I scaring you? 
You know, but, but, but listen, the widow is an example of sacrificial giving. And, and the more treasure we store up in heaven, the more we're going to experience here on earth. You will never outgive God. The promise of God is that as, if we give, he'll give back to us. He'll, he'll open the windows of heaven. You know what? And he'll pour out a blessing that we cannot even contain. But even if he didn't, we should give anyways. So as we willingly, joyfully, liberally, thankfully give to God, God gets excited about our giving. Just like he got excited about this widow's giving because God cares about our giving. God cares about how much we give. God cares about how we give. So let me ask you again, what is Jesus' opinion about your giving? When he sees, I wonder what he says. I wonder what he thinks. Well, that's between you and him. Honestly, it's not my concern. <laughs> it's your concern. I just know that I want, him, I want his blessing, so I got to do what I got to do. Amen? And so do you. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Let us pray. Father God, thank you tonight for allowing us to gather. And You know, I pray, Father, that some way, somehow, your word would have helped clarify some, some issues or some confusion in the minds of your people. Lord, I thank you that your love is not dependent on our giving. It's amazing that even though you gave your best, you gave your son to die on the cross for our sins. In return, what you ask for us is our hearts and our devotion to you. And I know that somewhere along there, somewhere in that devotion, Lord, it would be an, an acknowledgement, a recognition that everything that we have is from you. And that we would not be shy or upset or hold back because, Lord, we wouldn't have what we have. Lord, it's because of you that we have the strength, we have the, the health, we have the intelligence we have the creativity. Lord, we have the initiative, God, to go out, God, and do something with our lives. And Father, here in America, we are super blessed because there's many places around the world that even though people would want to, they don't have the opportunities. We have them here. And Father, for those of us that take advantage, God, what an amazing blessing you've given us. But Father, as, as we move forward during this month, as we speak on the, the power of giving I pray that you would stir our hearts, Lord, to the reality of how important it is. It's important to you. It should be important to us that we be faithful, Lord, in our giving to you. And Father, it's not the amount, Lord. It's, uh, it's the heart. It's the motive. We give according, Lord, to as you have blessed us. And, and Lord, if anyone among us says, well, I haven't been blessed, so I don't have to give. Well, that might be the case. So I pray, Lord, bless them so that they can give. I wonder if they will, if you do. But Father, I commit them to you. I commit to you our finances. I commit to you our management of our finances. Lord, nothing creates more stress in our lives than when our finances are out of balance and when our finances are out of order. Nothing creates more, more marital uh, discord, God, than the finances. Nothing, nothing frustrates us more than that. So, Father, I pray that we would get that together as we learned about that during this month. So, Father, we ask your blessing. I ask your blessing upon your people. And, Father, I do so and I ask you this. In Jesus' name, can I hear a good amen? Would you stand with me? And as you stand, give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. God is good. Yeah. My desire is the Lord would bless you. The Lord would keep you. Enjoy the, you know, the middle of the week is here. Enjoy the rest of the week. And uh, may his peace, his grace, his love, and his favor be upon you. And your family and all that you do. And your finances as you put in first. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. God bless.